Greatest Hits Radio, it's 5.47, it's confession time, and we welcome back into the confessional uh, Holly, who's in charge of uh, the show mm -hmm, for a absolutely. while. Absolutely. Yeah. Sick and wrong. Oh. That's, that's her catchphrase. Oh. <laughs> she sits in, in judgment on today's confession, uh, which comes from Andy. Brackets, not my real name. To be honest, they're never no. real names, mm. as, far as, as far as we know. This is a slightly, un <laughs> slightly unusual one, I think. Father Simon and the Holy Collective. Let me take you back to the year 1987. I had just finished school. My uncle was the area manager of a well-known butcher's chain. Oh. And he got me my first job as a trainee butcher. I had my, I had my own apron and everything. Wow. Great. The word everything is working, but yeah, I'm not yeah. quite... You meat cleaver? <laughs> yeah. The shop I was working was six miles away from home, and I had to cycle there and back in all weathers. The softies had cars and buses, and I would have loved to have been one of them, but no. Rain or shine, and wind from all directions. Yeah, I think that's kind of what wind does. Yeah. <laughs> I struggled to work on my, uh, on my less than fancy, pretty basic and standard issue bicycle. No gears, one brake, and a wonky saddle. So, for the first month or so, I got more and more fed up. That was until I spotted a girl. Oh. And the girl just started working in the newsagents next door. We're going to call her Sharon. Mm -hmm. Father Simon, it was love at first sight. She was the one for me. She was an absolute stunner. A right Bobby Dazzler, as they used to say. <laughs> it's a very, very long time ago. In the Victorian <laughs> ages. Yeah. I had genuinely never seen anyone quite so beautiful. I was transfixed. Every time she smiled at me, my heart literally skipped a beat. A toss of her fabulous hair and I was a puddle. And her smell was heaven sent. Scent? Very good. I think that was written yes. deliberately yeah. for you. Yeah, loved it. I'm, I'm hoping your listeners may well remember their first love and the effect that it had on them. Well, I was a classic example, a lost cause. But it seemed as though she was up for the challenge. We held hands. We kissed started dating. We went on holidays together. I was in heaven. I moved in with her as her house... Wow. Yes, as her house was in the town that we worked in. Right. So it's, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was the only reason. Thing. So it <laughs> Didn't have to cycle. Where's your house? Right. We could walk there from her house. The horrible bike ride was a thing of the past. Goodbye, rain, farewell, annoying winds, hello, seatbelt and closed windows. Mm. Mm, okay. I could put all my energies into my exciting new relationship. Well, everything went well. After six years of being together, so we're fast forwarding. <laughs> we have a little, haven't we? Six years of being together, it was real love. We got engaged, took a while, and we were planning our wedding. This was a slow process, You're absolutely right. Mm. And two years later, oh, even another slower, two years, right? Okay. <laughs> we were still planning, <laughs> but I had a different job. However, one day I came home from work, and Sharon said to me, and perhaps we should just assume she sounds like all the women in Monty Python. She says to me. It's over. I can't go on anymore. That's it. I'm out of here. So long, Andy. And with that, she was gone. Father Simon, I was heartbroken. Hurt, angry, but most of all, I wanted revenge. Mm. In capital letters. I'm not proud of this, of course, and I wouldn't recommend it as an emotion to your listeners. It can eat away at you, and I fumed for quite a while. However, after a time, I moved on. And then I found out that she'd moved on because she'd got married. I wasn't happy. I saw red. So you hadn't actually moved on <laughs> no, at all, really. Okay. <laughs> now, in 2001, I was new to the online world, and I had heard of a fantastic new website where you could find old friends and get reunited. Oh, that one. I forget its name. Yeah. I, look, <laughs> I, I looked up Sharon, and there it was in her profile, happily married. Well, I wasn't happy to see this, so somehow I guessed her login details straight away. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I, what? I, I, ch I changed the word happily to unhappily. So it now read, unhappily married. Father Simon, I had my revenge at last and I was happy. I slept better, I smiled more, I started going to the gym <laughs> and ate more fruit. That's me. I was happy. Holly or Susie or Katie will scoff, but I felt justice had been served. I'm not sure I come out of this very well. No, you don't. But, no, you don't. But let me finish my confession before you all rush to judge me. 
Fast forward 18 years and via Facebook, so this is a bit of an epic sweep. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, Sharon contacted me. We were both single. We met up, we fell in love again, and Sharon asked me if I had hacked her account all those years back. <laughs> I couldn't say yes <laughs> and, until now. Oh. And the punchline, we have now been married for three years and I'm sure I'll be forgiven for my crime of revenge. Will you? I, really? Well, I don't know. Father Simon, I seek forgiveness from my wife and her then husband. <laughs> so, an epic sweep of family oh, breakup dear. and also uh, computer hacking, which of course we don't condone. No, we don't condone that. Sick and wrong. Don't. Sisters, Holly. Yeah, uh, well, hacking someone's account is is never good, really, no, and never no. allowed. Also, I feel like you started off this marriage on a bed of lies. Uh, you know, you could have actually come clean. She even gave you the opportunity to come clean, mm -hmm. and you didn't, which is very poor. Also, I don't understand how people can be married for someone with someone for so long and not come out with these kind of secrets. I, maybe I'm just very bad at keeping secrets, but I, you know, I just feel like this is very, very bad, very poor behaviour. I know it was a happy ending but still not good so not forgiving at all uh, brother Matthew uh, Andy has very much been playing the long game here by um, well <laughs> clearly having a relationship with her and then it all ends and then we get back together and did I hack your account yes I probably did but I but I'm not going to tell you until I tell you on national radio that's how I'm going to tell you that I hacked your account um, yes yeah, so the, the butchers story went nowhere at all did it no, he was involved <laughs> in the butchers and then then he wasn't um, so yes I'm going to forgive just I don't know why I'm forgiving. There's nothing at all redeeming about this at all. I've got to be honest, I don't really see much future in your relationship together, given, given the past. Um, but but I'm, I'm just going to forgive, because, you know, it's Monday and the sun's shining. So there and the Olympics are And the Olympics are starting soon. OK, yeah. so is the people's worthy plea. Do you forgive Andy? I suspect you probably won't. Uh... I don't know. What do you? How do you think this is going to go? I think it's badly. going to go very badly. Six one zero five four on the text. First message. First word is Simon. Guilty or not guilty? Before the news, a confession from Andy about his love affair with Sharon, a first love. They moved in. They spent some years together. Then she'd had enough and uh, went off and married someone else. He was cross. Took his revenge by changing her. Uh, website <laughs> description from happily married to unhappily married. Anyway, many years later, uh, they are both single and Sharon gets back in touch with Andy and they've now been married for three years, mm. but he's only just admitted to yeah. the fact that he changed the website all those years ago. The people's verdict is in. Here we go. Uh, so Russ is forgiving. Despite the hacking and trawling of Friends Reunited and ending her first marriage, he clearly demonstrated true love and commitment to her and they're now happily married. She mm. was clearly happy to be back with him, so nothing to forgive. But Catherine Clydebank says not forgiven. I think the only reason you actually ever wanted to be with her in the first place was because of her convenient commute location. Did you only get back together because she lives above your current job? And Ricky says, after marrying, divorcing divorcing and then remarrying the same woman 15 years later, it's very hard for me not to forgive. However, no matter how I felt at the time, I struggled to condone the sabotage. That said, wish I'd had the opportunity. Okay. All right, so you get the general idea. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk if you have a story for us. If we use yours, uh, then you get a smart speaker. Well, it's 30 minutes to 6 o'clock. It's confession time, and today's tale... Don't forget the podcast, by the way, which will be with the new one. We'll be with you on Friday. Today's comes from Smudger. Smudger, oh, thank yes. you very much indeed. Bishop Simon and the Collected Reverends of Empathy. Oh. It was the end years of the Cold War. Oh, I like this. <laughs> I was in the British Army, but attached to the American Army, which was not uncommon at the time. During this period, this, this bit feels as though it's a little bit kind of suspect and a little bit spy, a little bit MI6. Oh, anyway. good. During this period, we used to move certain ammunitions in the air, think Oppenheimer, with ground units dotted along the route in case of incidents. Thankfully, there never were incidents, though naturally we were all suitably trained to a high standard. Right. Anyway, that's the kind of MI6 okay, bit, yeah, yeah, so yeah, who yeah. knows what's yeah. going on there. Anyway, we'd been working a few weeks with my American chums, including a personal favourite one. He was a mountain of a man, so you always felt safe when he was about. No, he wasn't camouflage. He was from Texas, so obviously he was known as Tex. Yes. My surname, Smith, 
so as tradition dictates, I was smudge or smudger. Working with Americans has its pros and cons, Father Simon. One of the pros was their kit. For example, they had glow sticks way before the ravers got hold of them. Ooh. And there was us British chaps with our battery-operated chunky torches. Very old-fashioned and they weren't even waterproof. Anyway, I was on sentry duty one night with Tex, somewhere out on the German plains, wherever they are. <laughs> German plains? <laughs> I looked up German plains, spelt P-L-A-I-N-S, and of all course. I got was Messerschmitts. Right. <laughs> anyway, but it's not those kind of planes. <laughs> It was a two-hour duty in a trench, and we were both supposed to remain vigilant throughout. So naturally, we did what everyone else did, I think, and we split it down the middle into two one-hour shifts. So one slept in situ while the other kept watch. I volunteered for the first shift, as I was wide awake, but mostly because I'd drunk something else the Americans had, Red Bull, which we'd never heard oh, of. Yeah. It also gave me the opportunity to investigate how these glow stick things work. So Tex, Tex made himself comfortable, uh, and drifted off to sleep. Now, as you know, glow sticks don't work until you snap them, and then they glow, a simple yet almost magical process. I needed to know more. I knew it had to be a simple chemical process, but my only memory of chemistry was getting a detention for locking Mrs. Fink in the photography darkroom. <laughs> <clears throat> so there was only one thing for it. I had to open one up. I grabbed Tex's Gerber multi-tool, something else the Americans had over wow. us, we were lucky if we had a foldable tin opener. <laughs> Forces folk will remember those. So the process started. I made a small incision. The fluid inside started to seep out. So now I had to snap it to see how it worked. I snapped, it glowed, yes. But as I brought it closer to my face and continued the snapping action, it split completely and an amount of the glow stick flu... Oh, I should say, don't try any, don't try any of this. Don't, don't do this with An amount of the glow stick fluid squirted into my eyes. Oh, no. Oh, bother, I thought, or words to that effect. Yeah. I could barely see and was in moderate pain. <laughs> there was only one thing to do and that was to wake Tex up Obviously, as I could not see I was flailing my arms around to try and get to where he was in his sleep but I hadn't really thought this through I looked as though I'd come from another planet <laughs> some mad alien guy we were trained to fight the communist threat not a space invasion so abruptly awoken from his slumber in some state of confusion by a thing waving their arms about with pulsing dripping glowing green eyes <laughs> he did what anyone else who was suitably trained to a high standard would do he punched me in the face <laughs> I fell to the floor like I said he was a big unit yeah Take that, you, and the hear you use language from the Shaft movie and song, which I will leave to your okay, listeners to right. fill in the gap. Space alien. Anyway, yeah. it was then he realised what this daft British bloke had done and he carried out the appropriate first aid, as I was in fact a daft Brit, not some kind of first-generation Incredible Hulk or space invasion person. So who do I seek forgiveness from? Not from Tex, I dare say he had a moment when awoken by this zombie-esque beast, but he punched me really hard for which he did actually apologise later. I expect he's probably emailed the equivalent of Greatest Hits Radio in Texas telling the same tale, <laughs> seeking for forgiveness. No, I seek forgiveness from Mrs. Fink. If I'd spent more time... Uh, sorry, if I spent less time messing around in her lessons, she would have had more stress-free classroom time and I might have understood why it was that a simple chemical reaction... Uh, and I, how it worked, and I didn't need to open the glow stick up. And now I know it's a chemiluminescence reaction involving diphenyl oxalate and fluorescent dye solution and also hydrogen peroxide solution. Peroxide, yeah. Invented in 1871. But uh, yeah. you probably knew all that. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Smudger seeks uh, forgiveness for basically putting a glow stick into his eyes, which is obviously a stupid thing to do and moderate pain. Yes, I would imagine <laughs> there would be... Uh, quite a lot of that. Uh, Sister uh, Holly looking very disapproving, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, we all love a glow stick. Like, they are very, very cool, very funky. But cutting one open, that's obviously going to end in a disaster. Also, at the start, when he said that there was a two-hour duty and that two of them were there and one of them would sleep and the other one would watch, why don't you just stay awake for both hours? It's it not that long much. a shift. No. Um, and just the... F yeah, as I say, going back to the cutting of the glow stick, bad idea, was never going to end well. So for pure stupidity reasons, yes. not forgiving 
thing at all. Invented 1971, not 1871, just... Uh, oh, yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the Napoleonic War. Um, I am going to forgive. Uh, I mean, I've, I, unfortunately, the joys of glow sticks have passed me by. I've never really seen the fascination. But I can, un I can understand you'd want to know how the chemistry works of, of glow sticks and uh, which of us could want to push that boundary as far as, as, far as he did. Uh, well, none of us, really, because it would have ended up with uh, it all over your face. Um, but he did the right thing, didn't he? Waking up Tex, who then punched him in the face. And we all learned a lesson about <laughs> hydrogen peroxide. So for that yes. reason, I'm going yep. to forgive. And diphenyl oxalate. And the and others, yes. And dye solution in 1871. 1971. And 1971. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. Uh, people's verdict, please, for Smudger. What do you say? 61054. First word is Simon. We'll continue with Tunes Day in just a moment, but just before the news, uh, we had a confession from Smudger, a Cold War confession, where he found himself uh, on some kind of shift somewhere in Germany, and investigating a glow stick, which he'd got from his American mate, Tex. And then he ended up with diphenyl oxalate fluorescent dye solution and hydrogen peroxide solution, invented 1971, in his eyes. Yes. Tex thought he was an invader from space and smacked him in the face. Uh, and it was... Uh, basically seeking forgiveness from his chemistry teacher, who he never paid any attention to. So now we have uh, the people's verdict for Smudger like this. Well, everyone forgives tonight. Joe says forgiven. I was fascinated by glow sticks when I first discovered them. I cut mine open, but thankfully didn't squirt it into my eye. Uh, Sharon in Kent, forgiven. We've all been there, and many generations after us will do the same. My grandson burst one open just the other week. <laughs> and Stephen Cumbria says forgiven. This evening's confession reminded me of my time as a Royal Marine in the 1980s, we also had light sticks. We also thought they were cool. We took them to nightclubs and we also opened them up. But hopefully you didn't get them in your Not face. Not in your eye. No. Uh, always use carefully and follow <laughs> the maker's instructions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Okay, 30 minutes to 6 o'clock. If you have a confession, we would love to receive it. And then if we use it, you get a smart speaker. And then there's a big, nice compendium and roundup on our podcast, which lands with you every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Today's confession and receiver of our fantastic uh, smart speaker is Dan. Hello, Dan, uh, and good evening to you. Father Simon and the Holy Collective, please keep me anonymous. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, sorry. I think I must have cha I changed everything around, so it's fine. And then, <laughs> yeah, 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 we've changed it. It's all good. It's mm -hmm. Let's call him anonymous, Dan. Let's, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I wish to confess something that I'm not proud of that happened over 30 years ago. The names have been changed and then changed again and, uh, to protect the guilty. And the guilty is me. In the mid-90s, I started going out with a young lady, let's call her Mabel. Mabel was attractive, way out of my league. And to begin with, she was bubbly and carefree. However, over the months, she started developing a flaw. Let's say she was basically extremely jealous. She would always accuse me of looking at other women as we were walking down the street. She'd say... Were you looking at her? You were looking at her, weren't you? And do you think she's more pretty than me? You do, don't you? You think she's more pretty than me? Anyway, I wasn't interested in any of the other women. So I pride myself in being faithful and I would always deny any wrongdoing at all. And this was kind of cute and lovable to start with. However, as this was now happening every time we stepped out of the house, it started to get rather tiresome and worrisome, if that's a word. She didn't like me to spend any time with my friends so I stopped seeing them to appease her and would spend most nights at her place or mine one <laughs> okay <laughs> one night <laughs> no we all get it yeah yeah yeah, yeah one yeah. night we watched the 1987 film Fatal Attraction oh <laughs> <laughs> after the film ended Mabel thought that Glenn Close was in the right all along <laughs> and they got the wrong ending <laughs> You, and, you, and you remember Fatal Attraction? Yes, well, I you've see. seen Fatal Attraction. Yes, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Scorned Mistress and mm -hmm. the Boiler of Pet Bunnies. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so on. Well, now that sent alarm ringings, alarm bells ringing, as I think it probably should. Yeah. And I decided enough was enough and felt that the end of the relationship had to happen. However, I was scared of what she would do to me 
uh, if I broke up with her. I wasn't really keen on rabbit pie. So I came up with a cunning plan. My parents lived in Portugal and I decided to go there for a three-week holiday. I didn't tell Mabel this, though. I told her that I'd been offered and accepted a job out there and I would be staying there for at least two years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off for two years. Bye. <laughs> She accepted that I would be going, however, was determined to carry on with a long-term relationship. Uh, Maybe she could come out every other week. After some tears and an emotional farewell, she saw me off at the airport. See you soon. I then spent a lovely three weeks basking in the sunshine, finally being free of what I could and could not do. Unfortunately, a lot of my time was spent buying... Uh, Tw about 20 postcards and writing a fictitious account that Hollywood would have been proud of. I wrote things like, I miss you, I'm getting on with my life, uh, the new job's hard work. And then after a few postcards, I would follow up with, I found someone else. I'll never forget you. Uh... Good luck with your life. And so on. <laughs> I bought a load of stamps, cost me a small fortune. <laughs> a small point. Yeah. And asked my parents to post them regularly, maybe every Monday, to Mabel to make sure that the cards were sent out in a specific order to keep the illusion going so she'd get the picture. <laughs> I flew back to the UK after three weeks, finally, young, free and single, and no hint of thumper pie anywhere. I started seeing my friends again. I went back to my UK job, and for about eight weeks, everything was great until everything went wrong in an instant. Mabel worked about half a mile from where I worked. However, she never came into my area, so I thought I was safe. However, on this occasion, <laughs> Mabel decided to walk past and looking oh, through the office window, she saw me sitting at my desk. I saw her at the same time, but it was too late to duck or hide or run. My heart was pounding as she came marching in, demanded what was going on. I said, could I meet you after work? I'll explain everything. I state when we met up, I stated that I had decided on the spur of the moment to come back to the UK as my old firm desperately needed me as I was their top salesman. I, it, I wasn't and they really weren't <laughs> no. desperate. It was a flying visit. I'd be gone in a day. Oh, you're looking very well. Life is like a box of chocolates. There are more fishes in the sea. Love will set you free. Love hurts and so on. I'm sure Matt would add circle of life, but yeah. really that doesn't fit in this case. Yeah. <laughs> she stated that she had just received a postcard from me <laughs> saying that I was yeah. starting, started to see someone else. I quickly had to think on my feet and I replied, yes. That was the case. I was on the rebound. I was torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. No one else can have the part of me I gave to you. Fortunately, she didn't know the Mary McGregor song that I was quoting, ah, which was very good. Yeah. She then said that she had started seeing someone. I pretended I was bitterly disappointed. I wish you well. Secretly, I was absolutely over the moon that I'd managed to dodge the problem of breaking up with her. I also had to phone my parents and tell them to stop sending the remainder of the postcards and to get rid of them. My fictional Hollywood screenplay was destroyed forever, although it cost a small fortune yes, to ring Portugal. As we've established. There's a little yeah. uh, theme coming here from tight Dan. So, Father Simon of the Collective, I wish to uh, seek forgiveness from Mabel, who I understand has been happily married for quite a number of years. I also seek forgiveness from my parents, who are unwilling accomplices in my deception and I await your verdict. Okay, well that's uh, that's Dan with a scary tale. Um, maybe people will relate to that. I'm not quite sure. A little bit fatal attraction in places, mm. Sister Holly. Well, it sounds like this wasn't the greatest relationship really and I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you were able to leave. However, this really wasn't done in the best possible way. I believe honesty is the best policy Do you? and frankly, he could have just said to her, look, this isn't working out and I think we should part ways. Instead of getting your parents involved, this whole story, going to Portugal, coming back from Portugal. She then sees you in the office. It's too long-winded, too complicated. And so for all those reasons, not forgiving at all. Sick and wrong. Mm -hmm. yes. Sick and wrong. Brother Matthew. Pretty, pretty toxic relationship, this one. Um, but And it wasn't exactly a foolproof plan, was it, to, to go no. to Portugal and then have all these postcards. These postcards that were, would continue to be sent when you'd got home and you live half a mile no from work. 
where she is and you don't think there's a chance you're going to run into each other um, but you know it's not a crime to be thick um, so Dan or whoever you are um, you know we're going we're to forgive because you know love did find a way because Mabel ended up happily married we don't know what happened to you but uh, hopefully you're fine love will uh, set you free love will set you free mm. yes. and for that reason yes. because of the love setting free I'm going to forgive okay whatever that means so yeah. Yeah. on the text please do you forgive Dan yes or no 61054 first word is Simon it's the people's verdict 61054 on the text first word is Simon over to you just before six a confession from Dan in fact it was the story of tight Dan and jealous Mabel in fact, she was super jealous. She thought in Fatal Attraction, which they went to see, they got the ending wrong. Uh, so Dan escapes to Portugal, pretends he's staying there, gets his parents to send weekly postcards to Mabel. But his ruse is rumbled with embarrassing consequences and the people's verdict goes like this. Not forgiven, says Shelley in Walton on Thames. Ultimately, he should have just had the guts to tell her the truth. This whole plan with his parents in Portugal is just ridiculous. Of course he was going to run into her. Jesse in Windsor says forgiven. She's found someone else. Else. If anything, she was probably elated when you said you were moving to Portugal. And <laughs> Sally in Swansea says, not forgiven. I also had a soft spot for Glenn Close's character. If anything, this story makes you look like the unstable one in this relationship. Right, OK. Thank mm. you, Sally. OK, so uh, if you have a confession, we can exchange it for a smart speaker if we use it. Send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. It's confession time. Don't forget the new podcast arrives tomorrow. Subscribe where you get your podcast. Send us your confession. If we use it, you get a smart speaker. Today's goes to Andrew. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much indeed for this. I should say, if you are amazing, that I should remember to say so before yeah. we start. If you're eating, there might be a couple of moments where you go, do you have to? But I okay. do, so yeah. therefore I'm <laughs> yeah. just telling yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Simon, Matt and the ever-forgiving Holly, I wish to confess my wrongdoings that actually led to me becoming a responsible leader. Taking you back to the turn of the decade, to the 80s, oh right, so quite a long time ago, I was an aspiring youth leader and enthusiastic Boys Brigade senior. Mm. The Boys Brigade Company, the BB Company, wanted all officers to learn the values of the brigade and to take on study that would provide them with council-approved leadership training, and so I was enrolled in a council social work weekend training camp. Sounds a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> I joined the camp early on a bright winter Saturday morning after being picked up in a council minibus, along with a group of others of varying ages, types and genders, as we snaked our way around pickups and off into the country to the camp location. The camp was held in a very remote location and an awe-inspiring mansion greeted us. The hexagonal central hall was amazing, with a shiny tiled floor and grand ornate furnishings. It led, we were told, to all the areas of the house and linked our activities for the weekend. We like to show you the grandeur of responsibility as you will shine in your accountability and obligations as great leaders. Our host declared, sounding disturbingly voice. like yeah. an Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah, yeah. The host and course leaders, Father Simon, seemed very much like an easygoing bunch of hippies that were welcoming <laughs> us as equals to the course. We were quickly orientated, yes, and got used to, and got down to business with a packed agenda taking us through the essentials of caring and responsibility. We learnt about presenting personal values, taking the lead, ownership of your actions and moral fortitude mm -hmm. which is what this feature is all about yeah. mm -hmm. it was an intense and long day droning on about the limits and barriers of self-control that eventually led to dinner time and a well-deserved break well we were tired and we were weary and when we got to the great banqueting hall a feast was set out to raise our spirits and we all ate heartily At the end of the meal the hippie host called on the course leaders to open the partitions and they revealed another banquet, this time all alcohol and beverages. Oh. It was the largest collection of drink I'd ever seen. A veritable off-license. If Carlsberg made training courses, this would be it. <laughs> well, spirits of all... That's an old TV ad, yeah. by the way, Holly, yeah. just okay. explaining. Spirits of all kinds were raised and for the evening we were left to our own devices as the hippie horde retired and left us to it. Music was turned up and we started to party. 
I had never tried anything more than a shandy bass, Father Simon, and this was an amazing <laughs> array of different bottles, cans and decanters to try. And so I did, because the course leaders had told me to. Yeah. A couple of hours into the session, my immature body started to complain, and I wasn't feeling as confident or steady about taking the drink, so I decided rather than look like a newbie, I would sneak off to bed and hopefully the strange feelings would disappear. They never do. Without being noticed at all, I wandered off in the direction of the dormitories. I'd only just reached the central hall when I'm afraid to report, in the words of Cat Stevens, I couldn't keep it in. I had to let it out. And this being a tiled floor, I duly had to find a mop and clean everything up, taking responsibility for my actions, which is exactly what we were trained to do. But I did go unsteadily to bed. I slept the night in fitful discomfort, as I'm sure you might remember, Father Simon. No, I've never done that before. But awoke quite refreshed and eager to get food and get on with the day. The mansion seemed eerily quiet as I strolled down to the breakfast hall and I wondered where everyone was as I enjoyed my pick of the buffet. As I finished, the course leader came into the room looking quite distressed and disheveled. Ah, thank goodness you're here, he said. He then related to me some drama of the evening. Apparently there were some hijinks by the revelers who had all been sent home and there had been several accidents two people with broken arms one with a sprained ankle and a badly bruised tailbone he went on to tell me that the group was so irresponsible that they had soaked the central hall and made it very slippery uh. and unsafe <laughs> but no one could explain how that had happened it was like an ice rig he exclaimed and a circus clown act with everyone falling all over the place it was a wash with water no one could explain how this had come to be I I cannot remember such a disgraceful group, he said. The council will hear about this and there will be action on all of those involved. I'll tell his reverence, yeah, is what he would say. have said yeah, yeah, yeah. if he was the verger from Dad's mm. army. But thank goodness for you, this leader said to me. You listened and you learned the responsible attitude and you will be getting my personal endorsement as a great future youth leader. The course was cut short and I was taken home by a taxi. I was the great responsible one, the future hope, the fine example, who'd only got there by creating mayhem and causing much injury. I had survived, the others had fallen away, quite literally. I'm hoping Matt will say something like, isn't that a lot like life? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever thought to show off their wealth yeah. by having a fancy shiny tiled floor yeah. isn't laughing now, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. I Good seek point. forgiveness after all this time from the group and hope that they weren't too set back by the experience of the weekend. I look back having become a brigade leader, an officer and section leader, although I never mentioned this to anyone and now I feel that I need to get it off my conscience. So he took advantage of a chaotic weekend which he had caused. Mm. and has lived off the glory ever since, says the Holly. Well, it was a recipe for disaster from the start. Drinking lots at a party, never a good idea. No. And so, really, he shouldn't have done that. He got very excited with all the booze. He shouldn't have done it. And then being sick, I mean, it's just all very gross and rather embarrassing, considering you're supposed to be a, a fantastic leader. That's not leadership behaviour. And so that's why I'm not forgiving at all. Sick and wrong. Is definitely Sick and wrong, right. yeah. absolutely. I get it. Matthew. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be very easy to forgive. Uh, number one, what are the course leaders doing lay on all that booze and then wondering why everything goes pear-shaped afterwards? Of course it's going to happen. You've given all these people booze and they've all gone, oh, that's far too much. And then, and, and also the cardinal rule when walking across a tiled floor is the you know, watch out for the fluids. Watch out for sli right? slippy bits of it. Everyone know that rule 101 for, really? for walking across a tiled floor we all know that <laughs> is is don't slip up so <laughs> so basically it's everyone's fault but his so uh, definitely forgive and nothing to forgive so for that reason for that reason I'm going to forgive have you ever had a shandy bass oh yeah shandy have bass you? yeah absolutely yeah very good have you had a shandy no, bass no I haven't oh, no. yes Anyway, that was the course of the problem. We'd only had one of those. People's verdict, please. Do you forgive Andrew? Yes or no? 61054. First word is Simon. Just before the news, uh, we had a confession from Andrew about a boys' brigade weekend, training weekend, back in the early 80s. Mm. And there was unlimited booze. He was a little unwell on a tiled floor. He thought he'd mopped it up, but then he hadn't obviously done a very good job. It became a bit of an ice rink and led to two broken arms, one sprained ankle and a badly bruised tailbone. Everyone else got the blame. 
and Andrew was promoted. And a very responsible leader he was declared. Anyway, the people's verdict, here it comes. And everyone's forgiving tonight. Mike says, we've all been there. I'm impressed he mopped the floor after himself. He could have just left it there. Ultimately, they should have looked where they were going. Callum McAndrews has forgiven as a former member of the boys' brigade. By you making the floor slippy and having all the others fall over, you definitely improved on anything that would have happened on that trip. And finally, Stuart in Troon says, my friends never believe that I was part of a group called the boys' brigade. It doesn't matter what you've done you're forgiven, as I can now play this back to my friends and prove it was a real thing. I think there are other ways of proving that the boys yeah. <laughs> actually exist. Wikipedia. Yeah. Uh, OK, thank you very much indeed for that. So your confessions, please. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. The brand new podcast will be there tomorrow.